Great. Well, next, I get the pleasure of introducing someone that I've worked with for a couple of decades, um, I think even a, a longer than I've been working with you, um, uh, Andy Trotter. Vice President West Coast Arborists, and Andy has been West Coast with West Coast Arborists since 1982. His experience includes supervision of all field operations, as well as overseeing safety, training, nursery, and wood recycling facility. Uh, Andy is a founding member member of Urban Salvage and Reclaimed Woods Inc., which is now doing business as the Urban Wood Network Western Region. He's ser uh, currently serving as the chairman of the board, and he really has a passion for trees, uh, both while they're living and the reuse of those trees. And so Andy's going to talk to us. Um, uh, Andy's going to talk to us a little bit today about where the Urban Wood Network has been, where it is now, and where we're going. And I want to say, Andy, I, I think the first time that I um, I think the first time we worked together was probably down in Riverside with Eric Oldart. Does that that I, we, I know we were talking about that the other day, but I'm, I'm confident that's where we first started working. But um, um, anyways, it's, it's been a while. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Andy, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay. Well, like a lot of people earlier today, my first glitch is sharing my screen. So I'm not sure if I'm uh, sharing what I want to share, which was the homepage of the Urban Wood Network Western Region. Is that displaying or no? All right, I'm going to exit from that, and I'm not going to worry about it. If anybody can help guide me through that, or if Jennifer, you want to pull it up on the screen, it would be great. Um, as Jennifer said, I, I started with West Coast Arborists in 1982. And so, you know, my journey and perspective through this whole uh, urban wood and, and uh, urban forestry uh, career uh, started there. I, I did a little tree work before I started with West Coast Arborists, but that's really almost the beginning of my network because prior to working with uh, West Coast Arborist, my world was really small. My view was really small, small backyard, you know, type tree service that I had. Um, once I joined West Coast Arborist, I had the opportunity to, to learn so much more. But just a little bit in reflection, I thought I would share also a journey that somebody else took. Um, about 100 years plus ago, his name was Aldo Leopold. And uh, if you're from Wisconsin, you probably are quite familiar with Aldo. Uh, you know, we talk about land conservation and restoration. It's something I became interested in during my career. He took a, a farm that was blighted by the Dust Bowl and uh, ran around. And uh, he was teaching at uh, University of, of uh, Wisconsin-Madison at the time and bought this dilapidated farm and planted about 10,000 red pines and a few other species there. Uh, as you fast forward in time, uh, I've had a chance to visit that farm in uh, about the year 2000. And, you know, those trees that he planted became a forest, uh, a beautiful forest, if not somewhat over uh, overpopulated, quite frankly. Uh, so uh, now uh, they've actually taken some of those trees and they've even removed them uh, and milled them and used them to make a conference center. And the whole uh, shack, they call it, that uh, he developed uh, has become quite an ecological mecca, quite frankly, in the area that was once uh, quite blighted uh, from, you know, the over tilling uh, activities that happened uh, early in, in uh, the turn of the century. Uh, so in 1980s uh, through 1990s, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, I, I actually uh, was motivated uh, in, by meeting Eric Oldar with California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. Now we call it Cal Fire. And Eric was promoting these concepts. Pre prior, to, prior to that, I had uh, played around with an Alaskan sawmill that I had purchased and a friend was a woodworker, so I kind of had that intersection between those two, um, you know, uh, interests between woodworking and um, tree care. Uh, in in uh, that time, they they started loaning out uh, sawmills as loaners to uh, people to try and you know take some of these urban trees and and turn into wood. Of course, many of us, including myself, were uh, like 
really questionnaire ourselves. How are people going to react when, you know, I go tell them we're going to cut down the tree and make it into lumber. And I can just picture the guy coming to the door with a shotgun saying over my dead body. Right. But, uh, you know, incidental to any of those thoughts, lots of trees got removed. And so the WCA was able to procure one of these sawmills and we started on the journey there. Uh, that time, band mills started to become more popular as a low cost alternative. Of course, uh, the actual industrial type sawmills in California were quickly disappearing for a lot of different reasons. And so, you know, the, the wood miser um, company, as well as others, um, really helped stimulate that. And this is a point of reference. Wood miser was founded in 1978. So it was just a few years after that that uh, I started to become a little bit familiar with the Woodmiser product. Uh, and it is another reference, the California Urban Forest Council was founded in 1968. So uh, I also became involved in the Urban Forest Council in the mid uh, 80s, uh, in late, late 80s and early 90s. And it was interesting because, you know, I started, you know, my career getting a little bit involved, uh, you know, with the International Society of Arboriculture, and early on, I was uh, able to become a certified arborist, and uh, you know, so we had a world over there of arborists, and, and uh, arborists were all about tree care. And then we bounced over to the Urban Forest Council, and everybody was really interested, engaged in kind of like that whole holistic approach to things, urban forestry. And I can recall at the time hearing from constituents that what is this urban forestry stuff? Come on, it's about the trees. And I reflect and chuckle a little bit, you know, a few decades later when I hear uh, that a lot of those same people are all engaged in urban forestry these days. So uh, thanks to Urban Forest Council for being one of those starters of uh, that holistic look of uh, it's it's about trees and people and all those different influences, the, the ecosystems that are working together. Um, it, it was easy was I get started a little bit and started messing around, getting the chance because I was lucky enough to get support from the company to uh, start milling wood. Uh, and we found tons of, uh, you know, arborists that just love that concept of the wood. So it became almost a a little bit of a marketing and networking opportunity. Thank you for putting that up on the screen there. Um, the networking opportunity of, uh, you know, just derived because everybody who loves the wood, you know. You can see some picture frames behind me made out of walnut that was cut 35, 40 years ago. Uh, started with Alaskan mill. Um, the... The interest was easy to share. Uh, we kind of, I looked at myself at the time as, as knowing very little and thinking how big the world was ahead of me and this whole idea of, of milling urban trees because I didn't have much mentors at the time, quite, quite frankly. I mean, we, we, Cal Fire has just been this amazing supporter from the beginning and, and I definitely started learning from them. But beyond that, there was not much. Uh, I, I just realized that, you know, the guys that are in traditional, um, you know, uh, long, logging and, and things like that, they, they worked for many generations and learned every little detail about, you know, five or six species of wood, maybe even less. And, and I'm sitting here dealing with 30, 40, 50 different species, and I felt like I knew so little. Um, but we continued to learn. Uh, you know, we had uh, early adopters like the uh, folks over at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and at the time Rich Thompson, uh, economist, and, and Sam Sherrill, who uh, started talking about the economics of all this and the potential. Uh, and you realize, you know, th at this time, it wasn't until the early 80s that they even charged us to take material to the landfill, right? Uh, and I wasn't so much interested in saving that money as, oh, there's a walnut tree. I can make something cool out of it because I knew walnut was a great wood and started messing around with a few other species at the same time. Uh, the Urban Forest Ecosystems Institute also created even way back a, a makers uh, and market index where we could, uh, you know, list all those that were interested in this subject and, and share. It, it kind of languished. It didn't really 
take off to any uh, great degree. And, and so, you know, from those uh, couple decades, you know, we, we had fun with the urban wood and, and we learned a little bit slowly, quite frankly, the progress was pretty slow. Uh, and this was all pre uh, UTU, my favorite university now, YouTube University, where we can learn so much so quickly, right? And uh, it really, I think even on the consumer side, uh, people weren't willing at that time to pay a premium. Uh, and, and, you know, of course, the, the taking urban wood and turning it into a product took a lot more energy, a lot more time, and was quite frankly more expensive than just going down and buying some other comparable hardwood uh, from some other lumber store, right? So uh, the industry needed to learn a lot. Um, we had some people with interest, but we just had a ton to learn. So, and, and professionalism was certainly lacking. We, we, we were struggling and learning real slowly how to dry wood or how to protect the uh, ash from powder post beetle and, and uh, those kind of things. So small scale programs continued. Uh, and, and, you know, because of the interest of people thinking, wow, when they saw something that was pretty cool, I got started to ask to do presentations. Others were doing the same thing but the economics were not really viable there. And then I kind of go into the, the year 2000 through 2016. It's a, like a decade and a half there. Uh, we spent a lot of time kind of like talking with the choir, right? We were all gung-ho. Uh, several times we got together. Uh, Jennifer's mentioned earlier today uh, with summits to discuss things and, uh, you know, the, the stalwart support from... Uh, Cal Fire uh, remained and, and they kept on trying to promote these concepts of, yes, we got tons of different values of, of urban trees and, uh, you know, from the nature to the, uh, you know, the environmental values and benefits and shading and cooling our homes. And we were getting engaged in all of that uh, pretty heavily with our urban forest networks, right, and as well as other arborists. Uh, there's a lot of groups that were making efforts, a lot of ups and downs in that progress uh, and struggles in marketing and, uh, you know, what species matches for different things? What can I use this, that, or the other? Well, you know, I mean, at the time, uh, you know, ash was super low value. And wow, I, I could figure out pretty quickly, you know, how much it cost me to mill up wood and you know and then if i'm only going to get that amount of money you know dollar or two a board foot it really just did pencil things like um you know we we have a lot of uh, urban trees out here that are uh, you know liquid amber american sweet gum another low grade pallet wood uh and it's funny because i just heard recently that bentley's now making their dashes out of sweet gum so it tells you a marketing thing that I think we're starting to learn uh, because they used to make it out of Carpathian Elm Burl, uh, very expensive. And today they're actually making them out of uh, American sweet gum, liquid amber. So we kind of continued our journey of the, what we referred to as the school of hard knocks. So I doubt I'll ever graduate, but uh, we persevered. We had curiosity and we continued onward. Uh, probably achieving, uh, you know, I put myself at about a sixth grade level at that time. After a couple of decades into the, the business, I still felt that we were that much lower. Uh, during that time, uh, some of the cool things that came up were things like Palomar College started promoting urban wood and now in San Diego. And they have 400 students doing woodworking uh, in their woodworking you know, vocational program there. And uh, they, they gravitated towards this idea of, you know, taking urban trees and milling it. We actually had one of our, uh, you know, four or five summits that we've had over the last three or four decades at, at Palomar College uh, at one point. And it was engaging, but again, we were speaking to the choir. We, we didn't get much beyond ourselves in, in those uh, efforts. Uh, the various tree groups kept on asking for presentations environmental issues were starting to gain a little traction and maybe that that peg was moving a little bit more towards that interest level uh, from consumers but it's still you know it was it was um, mediocre uh, even though it was definitely improving as a sidebar uh, during that time frame uh, John Mahoney who's the son of Pat Mahoney the founder of the company I work for 
started with the company in, in 2011. Uh, a few years later, uh, working together with uh, his uh, brother-in-law and sister and cousin, they actually uh, developed uh, in 2016, the or 2018, excuse me, the Street True Revival program. And what an excitement for myself to see that younger generation start to get in, engaged. And guess what? I started learning from those guys, you know, because they were they were thirstful for learning and curious and, and chasing all over the YouTube university to learn more and everywhere they could soak it up. Uh, and that recycling program has really built up steam since uh, John and his, um, you know, brother-in-law, sister and, and cousin and others have joined that team and, and developed a really neat program. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to um, see what they do tomorrow if you're able to join us for the tour. Uh, and, you know, in a parallel thing, we start to realize that that uh, there was, um, you know, uh, other groups across the country getting started. And I know, you know, we've heard some great stories this morning uh, from different people around the country. And, and certainly their journeys and conditions start from different perspectives because of what was happening in their area, right? Um, I was excited uh, when I would hear somebody like Brian Kemp from the Urban Tree Foundation start talking with Ed Gilman and developing standards towards a central leader stem and developing young trees that were resilient and hardy in a, in a you know, a streetscape where uh, if we weren't careful about that structural development when trees were young, uh, you know, trees could easily fail, like get hit by trucks as they go down the street or People live, leave lower branches on too long, and by the time they cut them off, it creates a big old, you know, decay pocket in the tree uh, because too big of branches are being removed at that time. And uh, Brian was another one of those that uh, I uh, enjoyed sharing wood stuff with, you know, and, and we went back and forth a little bit. And uh, he really, uh, you know, in, enjoyed doing woodworking at the time, and so I got him some wood and Oh, I met friends like Jim Downer, who was, uh, you know, uh, definitely engaged and, and loved the same thing. But I used to tease Brian that, wow, you, you know what you're doing? You're growing me some great saw logs. He's like, we're not going to remove these pistachios. Well, talk to Taylor Guitar today about the potential for using pistachio wood. Not that we'll ever remove trees for their wood, just as Aldo Leopold didn't plant trees so he could create a, uh, a forest for, you know, economics of, of removing and, and harvesting the wood. He did it to build the environment. And uh, at the end of the day, though, there are some that are available for, uh, you know, reuse. They die or maybe they become overcrowded or in their useful lifetime, life, uh, you know, lifetime. And especially in our urban environments, you know, we know a lot of times trees outgrow their space. Uh, we continue to have battles to try to figure out how can we create more space for uh, urban trees, you know, and it, it's a challenge, especially here in California with, you know, development uh, and premium of land values that, you know, trees get removed so I can make my McMansion, you know, twice as big a footprint as it was before. Uh, and the longer we can, uh, or the more that we can get space for trees, the, the larger we can grow them. But at some point when there's too much conflict, something's got to give, and, and obviously it, it's often the tree. So if we can grow them up to, they, you know, uh, completely fill their space, and at some point down the road they have to be removed for, you know, because they, they decline or, or other reasons, uh, you know, why not repurpose them? Why not make something neat out of them? The, you know, the next uh, stage of, of uh, development in the, in the networking thing uh, really started, it, 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 it was probably the third or fourth time where I was involved in getting a group of, not as just a member of a group of people that were saying, hey, let's all join up. Let's create a a group to work together and share our experiences. And yes, I'd already met Jennifer uh, 10 years earlier uh, at a CAL FIRE, um, you know, facility in, in Riverside, California. And, and that was the, the one before that where we all, you know, the choir said, let's go do this, right? 
in uh, 2016, we actually convened, uh, Ray Trethaway was a big advocate, and we convened at the uh, Sacramento Tree Foundation, and uh, the Cal Fire folks were there, and, you know, Jennifer was there, Doug Wildman, you know, Ray was saying, how can we all work together to get this going? And at that time, uh, you know, thanks to uh, Jennifer, really kind of grabbed the reins on this whole project. And, and started working towards developing the urban salvage and reclaim woods network. Uh, it was a pretty exciting time because we actually got a ball rolling a little bit. Nobody was quite sure if it would take off or if it would kind of, you know, they just, you know, go for a little while and run out of energy. But uh, Jennifer really uh, was one of those folks that, that kept pushing it forward. But of course, other people love the idea and, and supported it and, uh, you know, again, Cal Fire was just a huge uh, supporter of the whole thing and, and ended up, uh, you know, the, the group got a uh, Cal Fire grant in order to start, you know, developing that that uh, organization as well as um, uh, some standards. So, you know, one of the big lackings in the whole network uh, was continuity. Uh, you know, various times throughout that journey, I had uh, folks that would come to me and say, well, yeah, this is interesting wood, but how much are you going to be able to produce and deliver to me long term? I mean, there was always the the one-off projects, and we all still love them like crazy of a beautiful slab of wood and the, the story it tells. But you know, to to really grow, we had to you know figure out how to scale up, uh, and how was that going to happen? Uh, so manufacturers would say, well, how much of this, that, or the other thing are you going to peel? You know, what do you have, and, and can you really provide it long-term for me? And the answer was, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm, uh, I have a lot of red gum because we just had the red gum lerp psyllid, uh, you know, take out a bunch of uh, eucalyptus camodulensis. But, you know, was that sustainable, you know, and how long was that going to last? The manufacturing world, they want to look for you know, something that's sustainable long term, because it takes a lot in order to get these markets going and uh, engaged in that kind of thing. And obviously that ramp up is the big investment that hopefully pays off once you get everything flowing well. Uh, but Jennifer uh, took off and, and pushed a bunch of uh, the rest of us around to say, come on, guys, let's all, you know, work on these standards together. And, and we did. Uh, and, and, you know, things started to gel together here in California. A few more players that en entered the, uh, uh, the, the, the group there, uh, you know, the uh, Palomar College actually uh, continued. George Cass over there, he's a board member of our organization today. And uh, Sean, uh, Sean uh, from Pacific Coast Lumber. Uh, also uh, joined in and Pacific Coast Lumber was an organization or a, a um, urban wood group out of um, San Luis Obispo that was founded in 1995 by Don Seawater. He was very involved with the uh, Cal Fire efforts and trying to promote these things until he uh, sold the, the business to Sean O'Brien. Um, the, the consumer uh, based interest I would say for the last five years or so now has really spiked. So now all of a sudden, you know, we're starting to develop these, these standards. Uh, people like Pacific Coast Lumber and, and uh, Jennifer's company there, the Far, Far West uh, Woods and, and Wood Miser, uh, they all started to do much better. You know, and those that were really focused, uh, there was a few of them around that were starting to do much better. Uh, and they weren't just growing and then kind of imploding their businesses, but they were steadily gaining traction. Uh, we know today, you know, from the, the consumer uh, perspective that, I, I don't know, like a lot of you, I'm sure, uh, I enjoy watching all these home shows and rebuilding homes or building off the grid and all. And everywhere I turn, I see, you know, people repurposing uh, urban wood or, low scale, uh, you know, milling uh, of wood and, and using sawmills. And so it, it's just out there in the, in the public face all the time where these things are going. Uh, of course, the, the tree rescue program from uh, Sacramento Tree Foundation also uh, was, you know, going through their own uh, school of hard knocks and, and learning opportunities. And we kind of 
uh, work together to share ideas and, and get them some traction going. Uh, and, and they persevered, you know, like people like Ray Trethaway always do. Um, you know, the urban wood makers and manufacturers uh, were continuing to ask a lot of questions. And there was plenty of challenges. We've heard from speakers earlier today of all the, you know, the lack of continuity with urban wood and nails and metal and, and, and challenges, right? I, I don't necessarily have you know, beautiful saw logs in California compared to, I get jealous sometimes when I see saw logs that come from other parts of the country. But it's interesting because, um, you know, the street trees that we're involved with, they actually, you know, commonly have six to 10 or even more feet of a really clear log at the base of the tree when it has to come out, a really premium. Uh, but also the, 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 the trees that started to have decay or not, uh, you know, people found ways to start telling the story and turn those odd bits of, of things that weren't necessarily traditionally looked at as high value wood. Uh, they started to learn how to uh, work with that stuff and how to turn out these really gorgeous uh, live edge slab tables and, and different products that we have now. And guess what? People started biting on it. They started really liking it because they were seeking these you know, ecologically based uh, alternatives for uh, other other sources of materials for a lot of things that we use these days. So uh, definitely the, the climate for the, um, the consumer has grown and it's gone from mediocre to, I would say, uh, more of a high value regard and where the consumer is more willing to uh, invest in that because of the story because of the uniqueness, because it's something that uh, they can tell something about themselves or, or where they got the wood. Um, in 2017, the Urban Wood Network was formed, uh, apart from us out here in California, uh, but they, uh, they started forming and, uh, and, and they, they really started taking off on their own. Uh, they had, uh, you know, the different reasons trees were getting removed like emerald ash borer uh, and, and other uh, reasons. And so they started looking at ways to use more and, and more and more people were starting to get into the business. Um, the urban salvage reclaimed wood became, uh, began our discussion uh, during that time. And, and uh, when we found out about the urban wood network and Jennifer she was zooming all over the country, kind of really the one that was going more outside of our own choir group to learn more, uh, brought back to us the desire of the Urban Wood Network uh, for us in, in California and the Urban Salvage and Reclaimed Wood uh, organization to join forces. Um, I was one of those board members that I didn't even have to think twice that I said, yes, let's do it because the more we can spread this out across the country, the stronger our network is going to become and we're going to be able to grow it in a way that uh, we can learn more so much more quickly. You know, as I mentioned, when I started this business as a, a small backyard tree company, my, my growth and knowledge was really low. But the more I started to network, the more of these people I started to meet, the quicker uh, the learning came. Uh, today, the Urban Wood Network has uh, 165 members uh, in the Western region. And up on the screen here, you can see the map of uh, the network across the country, including Hawaii and uh, Alaska doesn't show any members, but you can see some dots north of the border where we definitely have some Canadian uh, counterparts up there. And you can see that real big density of uh, dots over there in, in the Wisconsin area, but also other parts of the country. Uh, and a lot of dots, of course, in California, as so many groups are starting to grow. Um, the, I'm showing you here the, the uh, homepage for the Urban Wood Network, and this website's being updated. But it's neat that it shows you uh, all the different members, and you can dive in and learn about them. Uh, I certainly am going to encourage everyone to join uh, the network because the more people that join, the more powerful uh, we can become. Uh, and what's neat about the network is we don't have to be able to do everything. You know, uh, West Coast Arborists and Street Tree Revival is, you know, we felt like we had to get all the different parts of the systems working and 
you know, we had to go sell to the bean counters that we need more of this, that, and the other resource in order to do the A to Z to get the whole thing to work. But with the Urban Wood Network, you can fit into the niche that fits you. And the elements are, are really nice and diverse. You know, log source. If somebody has logs or needs logs, uh, the network can be your source for uh, getting them to the best use. Uh, plenty of people interested in the milling. And of course, that's probably the largest group in this whole thing. Uh, and then drying is, is another big part of whether or not we succeed. Uh, but the biggest challenge for most of us has been the marketing uh, and connecting with makers and manufacturers. Uh, we've heard earlier today the discussions about standards and policy support. Uh, we all know knowledge is power, and I know we have a, a, a you know people in the in the chat today that have degrees in wood science. They're going to bring to us many more dimensions, and and so I'm sure you're all uh, interested in networking. That's why you're in this conference today, and you're all interested in learning. But the learning opportunities are just starting. So the idea of jumping into the network and being able to tap into all these different things. Uh, if you want to do A to Z and, and try to figure out how to do it all, great. But if you want to just fit into a certain niche, uh, there's great opportunity. And the more we do, the, the more that growth of opportunity uh, grows. I saw Jennifer just scrolled through a page that has a blog there on Taylor Guitars and, and the Street Tree Revival program. Uh, again, another big manufacturer that said, um, you know, what do you have? We want to use something, but we don't know what it is and we don't know what's going to work. So we literally went to, you know, some of our yards with uh, their folks, Andy Powers and, and uh, you know, Scott Paul and, and um, Bob Taylor. And uh, Andy Powers is their head luthier over there, was out chewing on wood and looking at it with a, you know, micro, not a microscope, but a hand lens and really dissecting it. And then he took uh, samples home and, and played with them and built some stuff out of them. And he determined that that green ash uh, we know of as shamal ash in California had tones that were amazing. And, and so they actually started making their, their first urban uh, wood guitar out of uh, green ash. I mean, they'd made some samples before, but as far as a production uh, item, that green ash and, and that story of that urban wood guitar really took off for them. It really helped us. And we were able to start uh, manufacturing their exact needs. Uh, they use our inventory as a source. Uh, I heard earlier somebody saying, what's the volume you need to start a program? And certainly you can start with just a few logs but with somebody like this, they wanted to know what was available. And we, um, you know, we're able to use our tree inventory that we, we have uh, out here in California and determine that, wow, there's, we had 40,000 records of, of shamal ash in, in our system. And can we create a sustainable supply? And we looked at the size of them, kind of like what Matt Ritter was doing uh, first thing this morning. And they agreed that, wow, this seems like we could have a sustainable supply. So uh, I think the Urban Wood Network is going to provide a lot of us these answers. I know I'm kind of running out of time, but, you know, the standards, the market strategies, learning opportunities are endless. Um, if you're a member, tap into the resource. And if you're not a member, you should join. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. All right, got some feedback over there. <laughs> Thank uh -oh. you, Andy. That was great. You uh, you nailed it all, and and uh, really, I really showed the power of the network and how it's grown. So we really really appreciate that. 